Well, thanks so much for joining us for Church Online again this week at New City. And before I start, I just got to say a special thank you to Dylan, our pastor, and to New City Church as a whole. As you can see, my shirt is not New City, but Citizens Church. And this past Sunday, we announced the official plans to launch Citizens Church through the leadership of me and my wife, Emily. And it's a special thank you because it's your generosity that has made this happen. Over the next two years, New City Church has committed to Citizens Church over $20,000. And because of that, we are truly grateful. These last four years at New City Church have been a, a, a priceless time for Emily and I to grow in our marriage and in our ministry, and we are excited for what is to come through Citizens Church. And so thank you so much for what you have done in your generosity to make this happen. But we are at New City Church, not Citizens quite yet, and at New City Church this week, we are continuing our, our series through the book of Jonah, today looking at Jonah chapter 3. Now, the book of Jonah has been very encouraging to me over these last two weeks. And honestly, it's because I see a lot of myself in Jonah. You know, it's easy for us sometimes to look at characters in the Bible, such as David, Moses, Peter, Paul, and not the bad parts of them, but the good parts where David is slaying Goliath. And we think, man, if only I could slay my giants and have power over them. We love that message that we are that David. But honestly, we're not that David. You see, in Jonah... We read the first two chapters and today in in chapter three, and there's really nothing heroic yet about Jonah. Jonah has been in complete disobedience, yet God is going to use him. That right there is encouraging to me and should be to you that when we read characters like Jonah in scripture, we are reminded that it is us. We are the ones in rebellion. We are the ones that are sometimes living in direct sin and need God to forgive us and restore us. In fact, I'm reminded of a night that I remember like it was yesterday, but it was almost two years ago. I was laying in bed in our apartment, and around 3 a.m., I remember myself, or I don't remember myself, but it had to have been around 3 a.m. that I finally fell asleep. And the hours leading up to that, I remember laying there in the dark, and every time I would shut my eyes, I felt the spirit of conviction that I had been living in a lie, that there were things in my life that should not have been there, that I was lying to my friends, to my wife, And I was living in direct disobedience. The best way to describe this night is conviction and confession. It felt like I needed to vomit confession. Every time I would shut my eyes, I could just hear the Lord saying in my head, you're going to confess there's things running rampant in your life that need not be there, and you are in direct disobedience. And I share that story while it's somewhat heavy because we are beginning today looking at this question as we study the book of Jonah. Can I be restored? Can I, a sinful human that fails, can I be restored despite everything I've done to a holy and a righteous God? And not only can I be restored, but even more so, what does it look like to walk in that restoration? You see, the Christian faith that we live in following Jesus, it's an active faith. It's a faith that is alive. And so what would it look like to walk, not in perfection, but walk and follow Jesus in our restoration. What does that look like in our lives after everything that we've done, even the things that no one knows except God and ourselves? So that is what we will be looking through today. And so if you have your Bibles, we can turn to Jonah chapter one, or Jonah chapter three, I'm sorry. But Jonah chapter three, we have to discuss briefly where we've been. You see, this guy named Jonah, he received a command from the Lord to go and preach to the Ninevites, a people group that Jonah was not fond of, a people group that was harsh. They invented crucifixion before the Romans uh, popularized it. They were a harsh people group, and God says, Jonah, go preach to them. Well, Jonah, in his own way, says, no, I'm going to go the opposite way. He boards a ship for Tarshish, and a terrible storm approaches the ship. The the sailors are terrified, and eventually they come to this conclusion after Jonah says, throw me overboard. So they throw Jonah overboard, and immediately a great fish in which the Lord appoints swallows him. It's in the belly of the fish that Jonah prays his prayer in in, in chapter two where he's saying, Lord, I will fulfill my vow even in the depths of this fish. You hear my cry. I will go to Nineveh. And so we see this direct disobedience in chapter one and then this prayer of repentance and, and somewhat restoration in chapter two. 
And then we see what Jonah does with it in chapter 3. And so that's where we'll be today, Jonah chapter 3. Let's begin in verse 1. It says this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Now let's just pause there in chapter 1 because this could be a sermon within itself. And there are good news right up front that the Lord has come to Jonah a second time. A point that I want to point out, which will be our framework for the rest of this message, right up front is this, that our God is a God of second chances. You see, Jonah was in complete disobedience. He knew the Lord's command. He knew what the Lord had asked him to do. He knew where the Lord had asked him to go, and yet he went the exact opposite way. You see, there are times in our life where, where sometimes we, we wake up and realize, I'm, I'm not following Jesus, and, and I don't even know how I got here. I don't know how I got to this point, but my faith, it feels like, man, at once it was this giant fire, and now it feels like this little kindling. How did I get here? But then if we're honest with ourselves, there are times in our lives where we know we are far from the Lord because of our direct disobedience. That night I shared about, I knew I knew that I was in direct disobedience in my life. It was not something that I didn't know where I was or how I got there. It was in direct disobedience to the Lord. It also reminds me of a time, and I think I've shared this before, where the day I got my license, right? It's the greatest day ever when you're 16 years old. You get your license. If you were fortunate enough, like I was, I was blessed to have a a hand-me-down Honda. So I had a 94 Honda Accord that I could not wait to drive on my own. And I remember that morning going to the DMV with my dad as he took me there, and he was going to drop me back off at our home, he was going to work, I was going to school. Or at least that was the plan. You see, the day I got my license, I don't remember why, but my, my wife, was, which was my girlfriend at the time then, Emily, she was out of school and lived in Greensboro. And so I went to school in Thomasville, North Carolina, and it was about 45 minutes away from Greensboro where Emily lived. Well, I remember my dad dropping me off that day back at the house and saying, all right, have a good day at school. I'm going to work. I'll see you later. And I remember instead of going to high school, I went to Greensboro, went to Emily's house. And while it was a great day for a 16-year-old, 16-year-olds are just dumb. The school's going to call my house and say I was not there. And so I remember being at Emily's house all day and receiving a call from my dad that said, I just got a call from school. You never showed up. The first day I had my license, I was in direct disobedience. I could not say that I just ended up in Greensboro. I was trying to go to school, but I I just ended up in Greensboro. No, of course not. I knew where I was going. I knew the direction I was headed, and I continued to go there, and I suffered the consequences. I had my license for a day before it was taken away, and I can remember walking up my steps to my home just feeling so distraught that it's like, man, I just got this paper license, and now I'm about to hand it to my parents. And so sometimes we are in places of direct disobedience. We know exactly where we're at and what we're doing. And yet our God is a God of second chances. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time. Now think about what Jonah's been through right now. In in chapters one and two, we see a terrible storm. We see a, 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 a near drowning as he's thrown into a raging sea. And we see him being swallowed by a fish for three days. It begs the question, as we read this book, where does God do the shaping of the man? Like, what was the point of all that stuff? Is God shaping him in those things? Or is God just punishing him for his direct disobedience? Well, I would say that it's in the storm, in the sea, and in the belly of a fish that God was shaping Jonah for what was going to come next. Are you in a difficult spot right now? Are you in a spot in life where you're not happy with your marriage? You're not happy with your kids. You feel like an awful parent. COVID-19 is surrounding us, and we feel like, man, I've been in quarantine for almost 90 days. Are there things in your life that are not going the way that you wish they would? Well, if I'm being honest with you, sometimes life just happens that way. We live in a broken, fallen world. There was nothing any of us could do to prepare for quarantine or to get out of quarantine. We just have to deal with it until it goes away. But there's other times in our lives where we are in direct disobedience. And if you're deliberately running from God right now, while God uses your pain and shapes you in your pain, you may be there because of your disobedience. Now, that's the not-so-fun news, the bad news, if you will. 
But the good news is that it is grace that God shapes us in our trials. You see, if we were to reread the book of Jonah with this lens, we could say that it was not God's judgment, wrath, and punishment that came in the form of the sea, the storm, being thrown into the raging sea and near drowning in the fish, but it was actually his grace that God would not allow his servant, his prophet, his man Jonah to run away from him and end his life in a raging sea. It was in grace that God came out after him like he comes after us. God is a God of second chances and beyond. And as we continue reading in verses two through four, we see what God is commanding his servant to do once again. Verse two, get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach the message that I tell you. Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's command. Now Nineveh was an extremely great city, a three-day walk. Jonah set out on the first day in the walk of his city and proclaimed, in 40 days, in 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished. So Jonah receives his calling. This time he does not flee, but he gets up up and goes to Nineveh. And so it would seem that Jonah had a change of heart, if you will. But then I guess if we were swallowed by a fish, we would have a change of heart as well. But what we see here more than just Jonah's change of heart is how the Lord works in our lives through our trials. And here's what we see, that God does not just call us from something, he calls us to something. You see, in our life, God does not just call us out of addiction, but he calls us to sobriety. He does not just call us from sexual immorality, he calls us to holiness and purity. He does not just call us out of hate, but he calls us into love. And the gospel is the good news that God does not just call us out of death, but he calls us into life. And I could put it this way, that honestly, I believe it's the grace element of God that gets us out of addiction, hate, anger, sexual immorality, and death. But it's the kindness of God that leads us to something. You see, it's interesting that where did the fish spit Jonah up? He didn't spit Jonah back at Jonah's hometown. The fish spit up Jonah near Nineveh. And so Jonah was called from the belly of the fish, but he was also still called to Nineveh. God has not just freed you from these things, but he has delivered you into life. And if this is true, like Jonah, our only response is obedience. We could say it this way. Obedience follows repentance. We see Jonah's prayer of restoration. We see him pray from the belly of the fish. Lord, I will fulfill my vow. I will go to the city. And then the Lord calls him. And Jonah does not just repent, but he obeys. And so what was the mission of Jonah? Well, it was the same mission that he received in chapter one. Go and preach to the city of Nineveh. He receives this command and is obedient in his going. So with Jonah, everything that he had just been through, he begins his journey through the city of Nineveh. And scripture tells us that it is a three-day journey through the city of Nineveh. So for three days, Jonah is going to go by himself and preach to a people that he does not like and a people that could easily kill him as soon as he comes into the city. A three-day mission. And here's his message. Did you catch it? In 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished. Now that is the best gospel presentation I've ever heard. I don't know about you. But think about that. In 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished. And then I can just imagine Jonah stepping back and being like, so what's your your response? You see, sometimes we are so hesitant to share the gospel, what God has done in our life, because what happens? We think, well, if I share, what if they ask me something that I don't know how to answer? Like, what if I share the gospel? What if I share the good news of Jesus with someone in line at Starbucks and they turn around and say, oh yeah, well, what about the ark? Where's Noah's ark? How are we gonna answer that? We are so fearful for what people might ask, and we're so fearful that we will not have the correct words, the verbiage, the knowledge. Who am I to share the gospel presentation? I don't have a seminary degree. I'm not a Bible student. But his presentation was short, and it was simple. And as we read it, we're like, huh, I can do that. In 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished. Sinclair Ferguson puts it like this, that it's not about having many words, but having words of faith. Did Jonah believe that Nineveh would be destroyed in 40 days? He was just swallowed by a fish. Of course he did. Jonah spoke this in faith. You know, I was reminded of a a call I got last night about 10 10 p.m. Um, A buddy that I had been discipling for the last few months came to Christ two weeks ago. 
And he called me because he, the, the, the work that he does is he works for a cemetery that his family owns. And um, he goes and, and, and picks up bodies after they've been deceased. And he, he called me and he was like, man, I was so upset that I was on call. I had to go all the way to a hospital close to 10 p.m. And I was just frustrated that I, I had to go out. But he said that he met a security guard there who all of a sudden just started telling him about the issues in his life that two weeks ago, his nephew was killed in a drive-by. Though not many words or many words of, I don't even know what to say, my buddy told me that in that moment, he shared what Jesus has been doing in his life, even though he's been a Christian for only two weeks. In that moment, the security guard asked him to pray. And at first, my friend said that his heart dropped. He was like, oh gosh, I, I, <laughs> I've never prayed like this. I've never prayed my wife. I've never prayed out loud. But he said in that moment, he prayed a simple prayer for this guy. And it was an awesome, spirit-filled moment. It's not about having many words. It's not even about having the right words, but it's about having the words of, of faith and speaking in obedience. And here we see that the words were enough for the people. This decree of judgment got their attention and turned their hearts to God because if we were to look at verse five, we see the response of the people. Look at verse five with me. Then the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and dressed in sackcloth from the greatest to them to the, to, the, to the least. Who did the people believe? Not Jonah, but the words of God. Who spoke these words? Jonah. You see, this was a word from Jonah, however short, but it was a word from the Lord, and ultimately they believed that it was from him. You see, the same guy that I was just talking about in the story that happened last night Two weeks ago when he called me and asked me to pray for him and his salvation, we had been walking through the book of John, and you know what he did not say to me? He did not say, Adam, tonight I remembered your words about being born again. He did not say, Adam, tonight I remember your words about um, um, eating of my flesh and drinking of my blood in John chapter 6. He said, I remembered what Jesus said about being born again. I remembered what Jesus said about taking part in his suffering so that we may take part in his resurrection. You see, Jonah was the vessel just like we are. But it is the words of the Lord that save people. And so the city of Nineveh has responded. They have believed God. And let me ask you this. With this gospel presentation that we see, and this, this attitude that we see in Jonah throughout the four chapters, was Jonah a perfect vessel? And maybe we answer that and it's like, well, duh, of course he wasn't. Jonah still had his baggage. He had his own sinfulness even after all of this. And while that's a duh for us to say about Jonah, what about you? What about you? We could say it like this. God uses willing people, not perfect people. Are you imperfect? Good that's exactly who God wants to use. He wants to take the willing soul, not the perfect one. You see, God used Jonah and used Jonah in all of his mess. Why can't he do that with you? As I was studying this, a point came to mind, and I think about this in my own heart, that we disqualify ourselves long before God does. We disqualify ourselves long before God does. We think in our hearts, if they only knew what was going on, they would reject me. God, you know everything, but if you really knew me, there's no way that you would accept me. I'm not perfect. I fail. I have things in my heart that no one knows about. And we disqualify ourselves thinking that God would never use us. But in grace, God sees us and our mess just like he sees Jonah's. And he says, go. Brian Loritz, who's a pastor now at Summit, says that often our mess becomes our ministry, our God-given assignment. So as much as God was doing in Jonah's life, we see that the purpose was not just for Jonah's own sanctification, but it was for the people that God used an imperfect servant to bring the good news of him to Nineveh. Do we believe that God is doing something big in our lives, in our mess? On my best days, I believe that, and on my worst days, I believe I'm a failure. Do we believe that in faith, we can be risky, bold, even crazy? Verses six, six through nine, we see not only the response of the people, but what they did. Verse six, when the word reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne, took off his royal robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he, cut, he issued a decree in Nineveh. <laughs> 
By order of the king and his nobles, no person or animal, herd or flock is to taste anything at all. They must not eat or drink water. Furthermore, both people and animals must be covered with sackcloth and everyone must call out earnestly to God. Each must turn from his evil ways and from his wrongdoing. And then verse nine, who knows? God may turn and relent. He may turn from his burning anger so that we will not perish. Look at the people's response. Even the animals are on a fast. And here's what's fascinating about verse nine. The king's response is, who knows? Maybe God will turn and relent. Maybe he will turn from his burning anger so that we may not perish. Do you realize that you are saved because of God's grace, not his obligation? That this king had it right, that who knows? Maybe God in his grace, as we repent and turn from our evil ways, he will relent from punishing us. It is not that grace, it's not merely grace that leads us to repentance, but it's the grace that truly forgives our sins and relents from punishing us. You see, the good news is in 1 John 1, 9 that it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sinful deeds. It's not that God just takes us from something, but he delivers something to us, good news of grace and freedom. And then as we close this section, we get to verse 10, and this is what I would call the gospel in Jonah. Verse 10, God saw their actions, that they had turned from their evil ways, so God relented from the disaster that he had threatened them with, and he did not do it. God saw their actions, He did not just see their sins for which he could punish and condemn them for, but he saw their heart of repentance and he relented. You see, the story throughout Jonah and especially Jonah chapter three is that if we will respond to God in repentance, if we will be honest about where we fail, where we screw up in our sinfulness, that it's not just a God who says, I see that, now I forgive you. But it's a God who says, I forgive you, now walk and follow me. If we were to look at the book of Romans, Romans chapter eight simply tells us that Jesus has come to not give us less freedom, but more. That Jesus calls us to walk in freedom. But before we are tempted to believe that God's graciousness towards us is determined and hinged on the obedience of our faithful works, I would love to tell you the story of John chapter 21. Simply put, Jesus has just been crucified. He has been in the grave. And the men who have been following him are done. They know their friend is dead. Their Lord is dead. And in this passage, Peter, one of Jesus' main disciples, looks at the other disciples and says, I'm going fishing. Do you want to come? The other disciples say, yeah, we're going with you. And what's fascinating about this is before, Jesus, before Peter followed Jesus just three years prior, Peter was a fisherman. And so after Jesus' death, Peter simply is saying, I'm going back to my old life. I'm going back to what I know, which is fishing. And if you other disciples, if you my friends want to join me, come on, because that's where I'm going. So Peter and the other disciples go fishing, and Scripture tells us that they fished all night and caught nothing. The next morning they look and they see this figure standing on the beach and this figure speaks out to them. You haven't caught anything, have you? It says in scripture that Peter immediately recognized that it was the Lord. He tied his his loincloths up, jumped into the ocean and swam to the shore. Now what's fascinating about this is just a few days prior, Peter had completely denied Jesus. When Jesus was crucified, the people saw Peter and said, you were with him also, right? And Peter being fearful of death, fearful of even being recognized as being a follower of the man that was just put to death, says, heck no, I wasn't part of him. And now he sees his friend and his savior once again standing on the beach and he swims to him. Now I can imagine that when Peter got out of the water as he walked up on the beach, sandy, wet, beaten down, that all he wanted to do was apologize to Jesus and get back on mission. He wanted to apologize that he would ever deny Jesus. Jesus is alive. Obviously, he is who he says he is. But what's fascinating is Jesus' response to Peter and the rest of the disciples. You see, Jesus does not say, where the heck were you those three days? I mean, yeah, you, you have some explaining to do. 
If we were to look in John chapter 21, the first words out of Jesus' mouth is, come have breakfast. Come have breakfast. And I can see Peter now being like, yeah, I guess I could eat. We fished all night. And after the men have breakfast, Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? In fact, he asks Peter this three times. Do you love me? And each time Peter responds with, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Of course I love you. And then at the end of that, after Peter has answered three times, you know I love you, Jesus simply says this to Peter, follow me. It is the same command that Peter was given three years prior the first time he met Jesus. Follow me. I asked the question in the beginning, with everything that I've done, can I be restored? In all of my shortcomings, in all my hidden sin, in all of my lies, in all of my mess-ups, can I be restored and how do I walk in that restoration? Well, I believe the answer for you and the answer for me is the same answer that Jonah got and it's the same answer that Peter got in John chapter 21. How can we be restored? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 tells us this. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. How can we be restored? Because the one who knew no sin, Jesus, was made sin. He was not sinful, but sin was put onto him on the cross so that we who are covered walking in sin can be made free and righteous before Peter ever did anything anything for Jesus after that, he sat down with Jesus and was reminded of the one who had become sin for him. Jesus simply said, sit with me and have breakfast. Peter was being restored to his creator, the resurrected savior, and the one who was made sin for Peter. And here's the good news. You can have this too. I can have this too. That night that I wanted to vomit confession, the night that I realized that I was walking in blatant sin, lying to people around me, something that was going to ruin my life. That very next morning, I was able to confess and begin a journey of restoration, knowing that God does not turn me away and does not cause me to clean myself up and do for him before I can ever follow him again. In fact, I would put it like this, and this is our bottom line for Jonah chapter three and our passage this morning. That before we are ever called to do for, we are called to be with. Before we are ever called to be on mission, we are called like Peter and like Jonah to sit in the belly of the fish, to sit on the breakfast with Jesus, to sit on the beach with Jesus and simply be in his presence and recognize that it is he who does the good work and will bring it to completion. This is our Lord. He sees our failures. He sees our sins. He sees our repentance. And the good news of the gospel is that if we will just be honest in who we are and what he has done, we can follow him with all of our fears, with all of our doubts, with all of our imperfections. And this is the message of Jonah. Was Jonah the perfect vessel? Heck no. We're gonna see in chapter four that he still had baggage that he had to work out before God. Were the Ninevites perfect? No, they were an evil people. But nevertheless, Jonah and the Ninevites both responded to God and both had the same gospel invitation to respond to the Lord in all of our imperfections and in all of our shortcomings. Before we are ever called to do for and act and clean ourselves up and be accepted before God, we are called to be with and recognize that Jesus is the one who saves us. Jesus is the one who is doing this work and he is inviting you to come before him and remind you that, look, you are a citizen of heaven. I have made you my own that there is nothing to hide, there's nothing to prove, And there's no one to impress. Before we are ever called to do for, we are called and we are beckoned to be with because Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us. Let's pray.